50 years ago, I was also a Kant expert. Uh, I wrote my dissertation about Kant, uh, and that is 50 years ago. Uh, I no longer consider myself a Kant expert anymore. <laughs> um, I have touched upon quite a few different subjects in my intellectual work, but the central subject around which all of my work ultimately turned has been the subject of private property. It has been my goal to demonstrate, not just to assert, to propose or to suggest, but to strictly logically prove that the institution of private property is and always has been and everywhere has been the foundation or the necessary indispensable requirement of peace, of peaceful relationships among men, that includes, of course, also trans people, um, and, and anyone between those, whatever, and along with peace also prosperity and in one world civilization. Because every action requires the employment of specific physical means, at least a body, some standing room, and some external objects, a conflict between different actors must arise whenever two actors try to use the same physical means for the attainment of different purposes. The source of conflicts is always in invariably the same. The scarcity or the rivalrousness of physical means. Two actors cannot at the same time use the same physical means, the same bodies, the same spaces, or the same objects for alternative purposes. If they try to do so, they must physically clash. Therefore, in order to avoid conflict or resolve it if it occurs, an actionable principle and a criterion of justice of, or law is required, that is, a principle that regulates the just, lawful, or proper versus the unjust, unlawful, or in, improper use and control or ownership of scarce physical means. Logically, what is required to avoid all conflicts is clear. It is only necessary that every good be always and at all times owned privately, that is, controlled exclusively by some specified individual or individual partnership or association, and that it be always recognizable which good is owned and by whom, and which is not, or by someone else. The opinions, plans, and purposes of various profit-seeking actors may then be as different as they can possibly be, and yet no conflict will arise so long as their respective actions involve only and exclusively the use of their own private property. Yet how can this state of affairs, that is, the complete and unambiguously clear privatization of all goods be practically accomplished? How can physical things become private property in the first place? And how can conflicts be avoided from the beginning of mankind on? And there exists a single praxeological solution to this problem, and this solution has been essentially known to mankind since its very beginnings, even if it has only been slowly and gradually elaborated and logically reconstructed. To avoid conflict from the start, it is necessary that private property be founded through acts of original appropriation. Property must be established through acts, instead of mere words, decrees, or declarations, because only through actions taking place in time and space, 
can in an objective, intersubjectively ascertainable link be established between a particular person and a particular thing. And only the first appropriator of a previously unappropriated thing can acquire this thing as his property without conflict. For, by definition, as the first appropriator, he cannot have run into conflict with anyone in appropriating the good in question, as everyone else appeared on the scene only later. The important, this importantly implies that while every person is the exclusive owner of his own physical body as a primary means of action, no person can ever be the owner of another person's body. Because we can use another person's body only indirectly in first using our directly appropriated and controlled own body. Thus, direct appropriation temporarily and logically precedes indirect appropriation. And accordingly, any non-consensual use of another person's body is an unjust misappropriation of something already directly appropriated by someone else. All just or lawful property then goes back directly or indirectly through a chain of mutually beneficial and thus likewise conflict-free property title transfers to prior and ultimately original appropriators. And acts of appropriation and, on the other hand, all claims to and uses made of things by a person who had neither appropriated or previously produced these things or acquired them through a conflict-free exchange from some previous owner are unlawful or unjust. Now let me emphasize that I consider these elementary insights argumentatively irrefutable and hence a priori true. If you want to live in peace with other people and you demonstrate that you wish to do so by engaging in argumentation with other people, then only one solution exists. You must have private or exclusive property in all things scarce and suitable as means or goods in the pursuit of human ends or goals. And private property in such things must be founded in acts of original appropriation. The recognizable embordering or enclosure of scarce resources or else in the voluntary transfer of such property from a prior to a later owner. We can say then that these rules express and explicate the natural law. Natural given the uniquely human goal of peaceful interaction. And natural because these laws are given and merely discovered as such by men. That is, they are emphatically not laws that are made up, contrived, or decreed. In fact, all man-made rather than discovered laws and found laws, all legislation, and I'll speak about that later, are not law at all, but a perver perversion of law. They are orders, commands, or prescriptions that do not lead to peace, but to conflict, and hence are dysfunctional of the very purpose of laws. The purpose of laws is to create peaceful relations. This does not mean that with the discovery of the principles of natural law, all problems of social order are solved and all frictions do disappear. Conflicts can and do occur even if everyone knew how to avoid them. And in every case of conflict between two or more contending parties then, the law must be applied. And for this, jurisprudence and judgment and adjudication in contrast to jurisdiction 
is required. There can be disputes about whether you or I have misapplied the principles in specific instances regarding particular means. There can be disagreement as to the true facts of the case, who was where and when and who had taken possession of this or that at such and such time and place. And it can be tedious and time consuming to establish and sort out these facts. Various prior later disputes must be investigated. Contracts may have to be scrutinized. Difficulties may arise in the application of the principles to underground resources, to water and to air, and especially to flows of water and air. Moreover, there is always a question of fitting a punishment to a given crime, that is, of finding the appropriate measure of restitution or retribution that a victimizer's a victimizer owes to his victim, and then of enforcing these verdicts. Difficult as these problems may occasionally be, however, the guiding principles to be followed in searching for a solution are always clear and beyond dispute. In every case of conflict brought to trial in search of judgment, the presumption is always in favor of the current owner of the resource in question and mutatis mutandis, the burden of proof, proof to the contrary, is always on the opponent of some current state of affairs and current processions. The opponent must demonstrate that he, contrary to prima facie appearance, has a claim on some specific good that is older than the current owner's claim. If and only if an opponent can successfully demonstrate this must be demonstrate this must be questionable possession, this uh, possession, uh, questionable possession must be restored as property to him. On the other hand, if the opponent fails to make this case, then not only does a possession remain as property with its current owner, but the current owner in turn has acquired a lawful claim against his opponent. Because the current owner's body and time was misappropriated by the opponent during his failed and rejected argument, he could have done other preferred things with his body time except defend himself against his opponent. And importantly, also the procedure to be selected for dispensing justice among just, along the just indicated lines is clear and implied in the very goal of peaceful argumentative conflict resolution. In short, for each and every property dispute between two or more contending parties, it must hold no party may ever sit in judgment and act as final judge in any dispute involving itself. Rather, every appeal to justice must always be made to outsiders, that is, to an impartial third party judge. Now, we may call the social order emerging from the application of these principles and procedures a natural order, a system of natural justice, a private law society, or a constitution of liberty. Interestingly, although the prescriptions and requirements of a natural order appear intuitively plausible and reasonably undemanding on its constituent parts, that is, on us as individual actors. As a matter of fact, however, we inhabit a world that significantly deviates from such an order. To be sure, everywhere and at all times, there are some traces of natural law and justice left and to be found in civil life and the handling of civil disputes. 
No society re rejecting all of natural law. Natural law in its entirety could ever survive. But the extent to which natural law is preserved or the degree of deviation from natural law is and has been significantly different from one place and one point in time to another. And accordingly, some societies are or have been more successful, more civilized, more peaceful and prosperous than others. Now this brings up the question as to the cause or the causes of such distortions uh, and deviations from natural law, or as we may say, of de-civilization. The ultimate error or mistake responsible for such deviations, we might call it the original sin, is the institution of a monopolist on the use of force or violence. Without such a monopolist, that is, without a state, as this monopolist is conventionally called, and this is what we are typically told in school and university, and what most people actually and habitually believe, there would and could be no peaceful so social cooperation among, among men, but anarchy would instead break out, that is, some never-ending war of everyone against everyone else. But this belief is not only empirically wrong, as looking around in the, in, in the world easily demonstrates, it is a big lie. That is, this belief is not just an innocent error, but an error deliberately spread for the promotion of unlawful purposes and with evil intentions. The institution of a monopolist on the use of violence implies that the earlier mentioned natural law procedure and method of conflict resolution through independent third party arbitration, that is, that no party may ever sit in judgment and act as final judge in any dispute involving itself, is abandoned. A monopolist of ultimate decision making, beyond which no appeal is permitted, is precisely that a judge sitting in judgment of conflict involving his, himself. However, any such institution cannot and does not help eliminate or minimize conflict as is the purpose and objective of natural law. But to the contrary, it will increase and widen the range of conflict. Whoever or whichever institution as a territorial monopoly on the use of violence can and will predictably not only be biased in his own favor in any actual dispute with some other third party, but a monopolistic agent or agency can and will also provoke, initiate and cause conflict with other people and their properties or possessions and then declare such interferences with and impositions on other people and their holdings as justified and lawful. Now it is easy to see then why the role or function of a monopolist of violence might be attractive to some people. It allows an actor or agency to live off and enrich itself at the expense of others. It allows them to improve their own well-being and social standing, not by having to go through the trouble of producing or selling something or of acquiring something from others through mutually agreeable exchange, but seemingly effortlessly by mere unilateral decree, verdict or say-so. The principal method of the excess for the exercise of power then is legislation that is the making up of laws rather than the discovery of laws natural law is replaced by man made pos positive law that is by laws made up to modify twist circumvent pervert or replace natural law provisions to its states 
to the state's own favor and advantage. In principle, as ultimate judge, exempt from all liability, one can decree that everything and everyone on a given territory be subjected to legislation. By decree, he could tax, burden, prohibit or punish whoever and whatever he wants. Every activity can be regulated, punished or rewarded by legislated law. Literally, nothing remains outside the purview and reach of legislation. Now, we here and now in the so-called Western world have not yet reached this point of total state control. But in legislating nowadays and everywhere, even speech and words by means of officially sanctioned speech codes and thought controls, we have obviously already come a long way toward totalitarian rule. It has taken a long time for the Western state to reach this point in its pursuit of power, control over others and their property and possessions. And let me note here only in passing the instrumental role that in particular the institution of democracy, of popular elections, majority rule, free entry into state government and so forth has played in the growth of state power. As you know, I've written a book on that subject. Suffice it to say here that the expansion of state power has proceeded incrementally, one step after another, and that for a very long time. Every step on this path from the initial establishment of a territorial monopoly of violence on forward to the present, has met some degree of opposition or resistance. Because by definition, every expansion of state power implies an increased range of control over other people and their holdings, and in reverse, a correspondingly diminished range of control of others regarding their present holdings. Every state decree, every new piece of legislation then generates some victims, some people whose control over something is reduced or stripped away as a consequence and who are accordingly usually opposed to such legislation. The state then, in order to expand and grow, must learn how to overcome, to break, to reduce, to silence, or to eliminate any such opposition and resistance. As a look around the present world amply demonstrates, Western states have made enormous strides in this endeavor of stifling any opposition. All presently living people have been brought up and socialized in an environment of a mature, mature state and learned how to live with it and put up with it. Private property rights have been eroded and curtailed to its mere bare bones. Decrees regulate in the minutest detail what you may or may not do with your private property. What and how to produce, what and how to consume, what to sell and buy or not, how to build, equip, furnish, heat, or cool your own house or factory, how and how not to transport uh, and travel by bike, car, train, and plane, what to eat and drink, how to regulate your own family and business affairs and how to raise your own children, what to say and what not to say, how to address another person and last but not least, what to keep of your own property and what to hand over to the monopolist. And yet there is little if any opposition or resistance to such increasingly invasive regimes. And whatever little opposition there is, it is mostly of the verbal kind and rarely, if at all, rises to the level of active resistance. 
Most people have made their arrangements with the state. Some work as state employees and some are be beneficiaries of state favoritism, funds and money. They tend to make no big fuss about state activities in order to keep their favors, jobs or subsidies. Others have simply given up and resigned and out of habit more or less quietly submit to state orders in order to stay out of trouble. And for, as for the verbal opposition, which certainly exists, it is almost invariably directed at the wrong target and hence ultimately ineffective and harmless from the point of view of the state as a monopolist of violence. All criticisms are typically directed at specific people or the operation of some specific department or office within the large overall state administration and apparatus. And the suggested solution is always the same, a change of personnel or a change in the organizational structure of state government. That certain functions or the institution of the state itself may be the source of a problem and accordingly should be abolished and eliminated rather than reformed appears generally unthinkable. Even the seemingly fiercest critics of state government then ultimately turn out to be state apologists. Indeed, they resemble those critics of socialism, this, of the old style, Soviet style socialism, that explained and at the same time excused the socialist regime's apparent failures by pointing to the raw personnel in charge. With Trotsky, Bukharin or X, Y or Z in charge, instead of Stalin, socialism would have turned out fine and rosy. In the same vein then, critics of the present welfare, Western welfare state model always point to some specific personnel or internal organization as to the reason for any apparent trouble and failing. And indeed, the current crop of politicians in control of a state apparatus, the ruling class, offers abundant room for criticism. Wherever you look, from the United States as a premier and most powerful prototype or model of a democratic Western state, to Great Britain, to continental Europe, and in particular to Germany, as well as to the former European colonies of Canada, Australia, and New Zealand, everywhere a similar picture of stupendous all-around incompetence emerges. Everywhere the mass of people, millions upon millions, is ruled by a small bunch of only a few hundreds or thousands of professional failures and losers, empty suits, megalomaniacs, narcissists, propagandists, sycophants, liars, crooks, clowns, plunderers and murderers. No. No, no wonder then that there is one scandal after another to be observed, day in and day out, and hence always plenty of crazy stuff to report on and complain about and criticize. And no wonder that the ruling class is widely despised by a sizable number of people. It is hard to swallow being ruled and commandeered around by a bunch of know-nothings and can-do-nothings of morons and imbeciles. Many people feel simply insulted and are being annoyed about the mass of incompetence, of ignorance and arrogance encountered in their dealings with state power. But to believe, as practically all current critics of Western democratic systems do, whether knowingly or not, that these endless scandals and annoyances could be avoided if only the current personnel in charge of the state apparatus were replaced by some other 
better people is naive and fundamentally mistaken. The current seemingly interminable march toward increasingly totalitarian rule by a small ruling class to be observed throughout the Western world can only be stopped and reversed then if the institution of the state itself comes under criticism and is recognized as a mighty criminal enterprise without any legitimacy whatsoever and run by people that are anything but honorable as they themselves like to be considered, if not outright despicable or crooks. Using Pareto's famous 2080 principle as a guidance then, one may predict or speculate when, if ever, the spook will come to an end and the state will begin to crumble away. Of all current and upcoming public state critics, that is, of public intellectuals, journalists, commentators, and so forth, some 20% need to come to recognize and be willing to say so and expose the state as a predatory enterprise and a moral monstrosity. To this end, it would be helpful, for instance, if out of the sizable number of current constitutionalists or minimal statist state critics, a substantial proportion would finally bring themselves to admit to the logical inconsistency and intellectual bankruptcy of their own doctrine and consequently openly convert to private property anarchism and to natural law. And this sizable minority of public intellectuals in the widest sense of the term, many of these people are not intellectuals at all, they are just babblers. But in this sizable minority of public intellectuals must then in turn bring about 20% of the general public of a given state territory to similarly see the state as a mighty criminal enterprise. To fear on the one hand, on the one hand but also to expose and ridicule and to scoff and laugh at, owing to the all-pervasive incompetence, arrogance and pretentiousness of its leadership demonstrated in everything this leadership does and says. Once this has achieved, but only then, if we are to believe in the Pareto principle, has the delegitimation of the state progressed far and deep enough that it may, may begin to crumble or, in Marxist words, to wither away and disintegrate or decompose into the smaller local constituent parts or components. Now, needless to say that we are still far away from this goal that much work still lies ahead of us. Thank you very much.